So LSU has a national championship, but I got to consider Clemson to still be the gold standard in college football and Alabama's in the discussion, of course, as well. We're talking spring football and going to Clemson with Pigskin. Pete, how you doing today, man? Here you know I am, Mark. I'm amazing and fantastic. And I almost forgot, I forgot to put my sunglasses on. I'm a no. I'm going to have to put them on. Otherwise, I'm going to hear the whole time uh, why they're not on. So I'm going to put them on for you. Yeah, it's, it's part of the deal. Yeah, it's part of the deal. The look. I'm looking for a sunglass sponsor out there. If there's any sunglass companies out there that want to send me free sunglasses, because I've got about 150 pair. <laughs> well, probably not that many, but a lot. And uh, yeah, you can advertise on the show and I'll wear your sunglasses. So we're not looking at the same sunglasses every time. Uh, no, I have a bunch of different ones. Okay. I see. Yeah. I wouldn't pick up on that. I'm not the most perceptive yeah. guy in the world. Right. I've got one pair. They cost me about eight bucks. So, so that's I've got how some, I I've got some of those. Them. I've got some of the high dollar ones and some of the low dollar ones. And quite honestly, on camera, you can't really tell the difference. So, all right. Uh, Clemson football. All right. You guys are in good shape, licking your wounds after a championship loss. But uh, still, man, this thing is just on a roll when it comes to picking up recruits and uh, it just being a destination for. Uh, the top players in the country. But the defense is going to look a whole lot different here in 2020. Uh, you had that famous group in uh, 2018, that defensive front that could be considered the greatest in college football history when you both look at productivity at the collegiate level and then as that translated to NFL draft status. Uh, how would you evaluate how they played uh, with all the new players up front last year in comparison? Well, it was a totally different looking defense altogether. Uh, Clemson's normally played a 4-3 under Brent Venables when they've had the defensive line to do it. This year they played a lot of 3-4. And um, I expect them with the veterans that are coming back this year as well as some of these amazing guys that are coming in this year that aren't just going to be uh, you know, role players like a lot of the freshmen are. I think they're gonna be, you're going to see a lot of uh, first day, day one starters on that defensive line that are freshmen. And so I expect to see a lot more of the 4-3. As, as far as the way they played last year, um, they played as well as they could with the personnel that they had. Honestly, I mean, I, I, was, I wasn't I was disappointed. It was just a different looking type of defense, but I, I still think they held their own for, uh, for them. And listen, they were number one defense in the country up until they played LSU. So I can't complain about that. All right, let's kind of take it through uh, in regards to the three levels. Uh, what are you looking to see in spring practice? Are you going to be able to see anything that's going to give you a little bit of, of uh, a little bit of comfort headed toward August, or maybe a little bit of concern as you go through the line, the linebackers, and the secondary? Yeah, so spring practice has actually started uh, about six days ago, I think. So we're we're well into it here, and um, I haven't seen a whole lot of video footage from that, and I don't really think they actually put a lot of video footage of, of that out. I, all I have to go off of, of what's happened so far is what Dabo Sweeney said. And this is one of those things that's great about Coach Sweeney <laughs> because he he says a lot <laughs> and he, he, you know, he talks too much. It, it, people who aren't fans of the Clemson Tigers uh, could, you know, probably do without so much talking from him. But if you're a oh, fan, he gives me a few things to say. Yeah. I, I go after him once in a while. But the good thing about him, if you're a fan, is he'll, he'll give you no shortage of information. Um, he'll, he'll guard them a, a little bit as far as injuries are go, you know, that's probably more of a personal thing with him, but, but, it, but the favorite thing I like about Sweeney when he's, uh, evaluating these new guys and trying to get across to the fans and the media about what kind of player they are, because he's been there for so long, coach Sweeney has at the university, he's always comparing this new guy to a guy from the past, whether it's from two years ago or from 15 years ago, right? So he always makes these comparisons and he'll kind of give you a little bit of insight into what kind of a uh, player they're going to be. Uh, a couple of minor injuries, I think, in this uh, spring practice so far. Uh, Brian Brzee, who's the number one, was the number one overall player in the country, defensive tackle. Uh, I think he was a little bit banged up with like a twisted ankle or something. No, but, no, but luckily, not unlike last year, I don't see any major injury problems going on uh, so far this year. So that's a good thing. Uh, just a couple of nicks and bruises, you know, normal stuff when you start uh, when you start spring, spring practice. But uh, the guys I'm looking forward to seeing the most, both in spring practice and in the spring game a month from now, is always going to be the, the incoming hotshot guys, right? So Brian Brzee, Miles Murphy, uh, Demarcus Bowman, the running back out of Florida, who was uh, uh, Mr. Football in Florida last year, 2019. So he's a, a great player. Demonte Capehart, 
Uh, DJ Uyunglele, the, the hotshot quarterback, is coming in from California. Trey Williams, defensive tackle. Fred Davis, cornerback. Uh, Eddie Williams, Jr., wide receiver. Uh, Trenton Simpson, the linebacker. Uh, so there's a bunch of guys. And that's that's what I, that's always what I focus on when I go to these spring games because I go to these spring games every single season now. It's sort of a tradition for me to go with a couple of a uh, couple of my buddies. Uh, some of you have, you know know some of them from uh, your your chat room on YouTube here, but uh, those are the ones I always look forward to seeing the most are, are the new guys. So, yeah, you just you just spit out uh, like a dozen four and five stars. Yeah. If you could pin it down to two or three in regards to maybe a little higher expectation of what you're going to see, not just in the spring game, but maybe because of situational uh, positional need, mm -hmm. plus just their outstanding ceiling that they could actually make a pretty serious impact in the fall. Yeah. So both at least two of these will be defensive linemen, Brian Brzee, who is the guy I'm looking forward to out of all of these recruits to seeing the most, uh, I have just been blown away from his tape and I realize high school tape, and highlights and things like that. You can only learn so much from that, right? But um, looking at some of these like elite top, top level players, high school tape over the past say, 15 years, the only one I could say that was as dominant at this guy was at the high school level on the defensive line was Jadavion Clowney from South Carolina. And so that's what you see from Brian Brzee on his high school tape. Uh, he, he's just, he's already, you know, a lot of these guys come from high school, they need a year or two to mature physically. And uh, and skill wise, and he just seems to be one of these guys. You can plug him right in there, and he's just going to be a game wrecker all day one. So he's number one. Uh, also at defensive end, Miles Murphy, um, and and then the other guy on the defensive line is Demonte Capard. So those are the three. And again, that's that's three defensive linemen uh, that I'm looking forward to seeing the most. Everything's going to be on the on the line there. What's crazy about Brzee in regards to the um, the expectations is if you look up his recruiting numbers, you just see ones across the board. Number one player in the state, number one player at his position, number one player, period. Yeah. And then I just saw a number uh, the other day, uh, the 247 composite has him rated as the 15th rated, highest rated player in the history of their ratings. Yeah. Since they started ratings, top 15, period. Yeah, his size, his speed, just everything. Um, he just looks like he's already a 20 year old kid who's been playing college football for a couple of years. Uh, and even from what I heard, you know, from him at spring practice, I don't think he's been, has been doing full drills, but, uh, he's just throwing people around. I mean, we're talking about veteran offensive linemen. He's, he's throwing around like the rag dolls. So yeah, I, 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 he's the one I can't wait to see the most. Murphy, uh, highly regarded as well, a top seven player, not mm -hmm. at his position, all positions. So he's the top seven player. Uh, number one rated player, uh, just taking it off the beaten path in regards to what's going to happen in Clemson. And as you mentioned, they've already hit the practice field. This uh, turnout by Isaiah Simmons at the NFL Combine was pretty serious. Yeah, he's a he's a unique kind of player. So the question is, what will wherever he's drafted, what position will he play? Because he can play legitimately at a pro level. He could play cornerback. He could certainly play safety. And I think he could play linebacker. His size and speed and just uh, his ability to track the ball and his tackling ability, which I think is probably one of the best in the country. He's, I think he led the country in tackles last year. He certainly led Clemson in the ACC in tackles. He was right up there as far as power five tacklers. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a um, – well, I'm trying to think of a clean way to say this. He's <laughs> – He's, he's nasty. Every, he's no. I was going to say something else, but he, he's everything that a defensive coordinator is dreaming about. Let's put it that way. Uh, if you're an NFL player, um, he reminds me a lot of Shaq Thompson that got drafted by Carolina three or four years ago, and he just when when Shaq Thompson came out of I think Oregon, right? Um, he was just labeled as an athlete. Now he played all over the field and in, in college. I, but Isaiah Simmons, I don't think is going to have a hard time, you know stepping into whatever role they put him in. I think they'll give him a definite role. He won't just be an athlete. He'll be either a linebacker or a safety or depending on which defensive coordinator gets a hold of him. Got Pigskin Pete on the line talking Clemson football. The Tigers are on the practice field with spring, the spring game just about a month away. And um, I got to say that over the past couple of years in thinking about spring games, so this happens to me every year. I'm so starved for college football that when I, I, I really started to get geeked up for, for spring football, and then I watch about five plays of these spring games, and then I realize, oh, yeah, 
this isn't football. This isn't real football. But yeah. the way they've done it at Clemson the past couple of years with the help of the network uh, at ESPN, they've made it more of a show. Not They're not covering a game. Most of these networks screw up mm-hmm. by covering these like they're actual games. They're not games. Yeah, uh, you got to supplement it with storylines and you got to talk to the key people. So they get right on the field. They got Dabo there. They talk to Venables. They bring some players over. They mm-hmm. talk about key situations. I thought it was fascinating. I think it was um, Darian Kendrick who was moved from wide receiver to mm-hmm. defensive back and really talked about the transition he would have to make, really highlighted him, that ridiculous group of wideouts that you brought in as a freshman class with uh, uh, Nagata and Latson mm-hmm. last year and really highlighted those guys. And uh, Dabo was really uh, specific in talking about not just being freakish athletes, but they were so collegiate ready just in regards to their understanding of coverages, how to find the soft spot, how to line up, how mm-hmm. to break. Uh, it, it was just, uh, it was it was probably the best spring game I've ever seen just from the standpoint of information. Yeah, there's, you're seeing a lot of other teams start to do that now. Now, since I go to these games, I don't get that perspective until I get home and rewatch it. You know, I'm, I'm in the stands. But uh, yeah, you're right. It's, it is a different way of seeing things from field level with all the interviews. And they're, and they're going from uh, sideline reporter to sideline reporter and they're having conversations. Uh, one thing that I think you will definitely see this year as far as individual players that Dabo seems to be focusing on already, veteran players, not new players, are two guys in particular that have been labeled by some people to be potential busts who were both five-star, highly, highly recruited guys going into the third season now. And those would be Xavier Thomas and KJ Henry, both defensive linemen. And he's already, through his interviews after these spring practices, he's hammering home the fact that these guys are not busts and he thinks they're going to have great breakout years. And they've both matured so much, uh, both physically and mentally in the off season that uh, he thinks they're going to have breakout years. And he reminded some of us fans who, you know, get a little bit uh, crazy. We expect some of these guys like Brzee to come in there and just and wreck college football as a true freshman. And if they don't do that in the freshman or sophomore year, then we start labeling them. They're a bust. Well, he said, he said, do you guys remember uh, branch? Do you guys remember a guy named Vic Beasley? These guys didn't start a game until their senior year and they're legends at Clemson. And then they also went on to be highly drafted and, uh, you know, great players in the NFL. So he's, he's saying that where Xavier Thomas and KJ Henry are actually are ahead of where guys like branch and Beasley were at the same time. So you got to, you know, some guys just uh, take a little bit more time. Xavier Thomas is, is a, uh, a special case in itself. You know, I don't think he started playing football until late in high school. He was just a big fast guy who was a freak athlete and who he dominated at the high school level because of his athleticism and size and speed. But when he got into college football, he had to learn how to actually play football because there's other guys on the other side of the ball who are just as fast and, and big as you are in college, right? So uh, he seems to have hopefully bridged that gap. And so I, I'm really hoping that Sweeney is um, is right about these two guys, and we'll see if they are this year. You mentioned those two names, and the first thought that came across my head was, number one, I can't believe that it's been that long since I thought about those guys coming out of high school because as soon as you named the names, I was like, yeah, those guys were huge recruits, Mm -hmm. both of them, and I haven't given much thought to either one of them. If you look at the productivity last season, it's it's not bad. It's not all-America status that you would expect when they were recruited. Thomas had 27 tackles. He had eight tackles for loss and one and a half sacks. KJ Henry at 23 tackles, four and a half tackles for loss, two sacks. But man, obviously offensive linemen have no stats. You got to really watch the game tape to understand how good they are. The defensive Mm -hmm. line, we get a little bit caught up in tackles for loss and sacks. And that doesn't necessarily tell the story when it comes to these guys because of double teams and situations and rotations and and so forth. So uh, especially those, those, uh, those space eaters in the middle, they're not going to rack up a bunch of stats. Yeah. And th- these, th- these two guys are very different. So KJ Henry, he's going into his third year, but he was red shirted his, his freshman year. So he didn't play hardly at all his freshman year. Uh, Xavier Thomas in their hand did, he played a lot his freshman year. And then last year he was sort of uh, on and off the field with nagging small type of injuries. He, well, he had one that was actually a pretty major injury. It was a, a bad concussion that he got at, pr- at practice, not in a game. 
And so that kept him out for four weeks or so. So he didn't have a whole lot of uh, continuity in his season. You know, he, he he never really seemed to, to get his legs underneath him. Um, so he's, he seems to be healthy now. And KJ Henry seems to be just, you know, just now coming into being able to adapt to the college game better. Uh, but like you said, these are two freak athletes. If you, if you just, uh, if you took the Jersey off of them and the number and the helmet, anybody in the country just watching them run around would want any of these, either one of these guys on their team in a heartbeat. Right. But, um, but sometimes again, like sometimes it takes time for these guys who are just great athletes to learn that, uh, you know, this is, there's more than just being a, a great athlete. You get, you actually gotta, you gotta know the X's and O's and, and to play in a Brent Venables defense, it's something that very few people are, are ready to do. I don't care how good of an athlete you are, you know, right out of the, out of, out of high school. And I think the combine shows us that when you really listen to the analysts that know what they're talking about, when they talk about hand placement and they talk about all sorts of just technique uh, specifics that are so minute, but um, you know, you can be a freak athlete, six, five run like the wind, the whole deal. But um, if you don't have at least good technique, obviously the athleticism needs to be there. Then you're not necessarily going to be the player that uh, the scouts saw when they saw you on the field uh, for the first time and working yeah. out. And Sweeney knows another one of his, you know, cheesy things that he says, but it's actually a lot of truth in it is that he says, you'll sometimes you'll see a guy that has five-star talent, but he's only a three-star commitment. Or, or some guys that have three-star talent, but they're five-star commitment. So uh, as long as these guys that, that have this talent can stick with it and don't get frustrated because they're not starting and they're a five-star guy after two years and then they you know transfer out or quit school or whatever it is, if they stick with it, eventually if you're working with Brent Venables and you had that kind of talent and you have commitment, you're going to be great eventually. Clemson's on the practice field. We're talking to Pigskin Pete uh, about the Tigers uh, hoping to reclaim a national championship, and obviously they own the ACC. Uh, as soon as you mentioned five-star commitment versus three-star talent, I thought of Hunter Renfro. <laughs> Adam Humphreys obviously was the was the uh, forerunner to that position. For as good as this wide receiver core is, do they miss that? Of course, they miss that guy. But do they miss that type of player, the Julian Edelman type that can, sure. that can convert the third and five? They sure do. Yeah, it, he's a, he was a hard guy to replace. It, it, the, the offense looked a lot different without Renfro. Third and Renfro is what we called him at Clemson, and that's translated over to the Raiders. He's the biggest third down guy in the history of our program. And uh, yeah, he just never dropped the ball. I think it was... Uh, what was it? 2017. He, uh, he didn't have a single drop the whole season, not one. And, uh, you know, there, he was the only guy in the country that didn't have a single drop in the whole season. So yeah, that, that does hurt. Uh, having a guy that that's just that reliable, um, to catch the ball whenever you need him to catch it is going to hurt. I, we thought, or at least I thought, and I know some other fans thought that Amari Rogers would step into that role last year, but at the end of the day, they're, they're not the same player. Right. I mean, Amari Rogers is uber talented guy. He's dangerous with the ball in his hands, but he's not Hunter Renfro and Hunter Renfro is not Amari Rogers. They, they both have a different type of skill set. So the question is, I mean, I don't know how you replace a Renfro two years later. Can we do who will step into that role and, and who will it be? And, and can it be even be done? I don't know. Got Pigskin Pete on the line talking Clemson football and uh, we'll see the Tigers on the practice field for their spring game in just about a month. Uh, as you look across the country, uh, as we head toward, you know, get through the spring, head toward August, uh, after that elite level of what we expect, and we'll see if LSU is going to stay around or they're, they're a one hit wonder, but if they're going to stay in that Alabama, Clemson, Ohio state place, uh, who intrigues you across the country, whether it's one team, two or three teams as possibly breaking through this year and joining that level, Oregon. Now, this, there's no question about it. And I know Herbert's gone, and that's the biggest question, Mark, is what, what will his replacement do compared to what he did? But I think that Oregon has the chance to be the Clemson of the Pac-12 because you're talking about two uh, conferences, two leagues that are, aren't relatively strong from top to bottom. You've got the one juggernaut at the top, which I think Oregon's getting up there uh, to that level. As far as the recruiting and the talent and the coaching, uh, there's just nobody else in the Pac-12 right now that can compete with that. Uh, they're starting to get a lot of continuity there with the coaching staff, which is another thing that I think is very important. That's been one of the biggest saving graces for Clemson over the past decade is the coaching continuity. And I think that goes a long way with recruiting and just the development of players. Um, so, yeah, I think Oregon is that team. Um, you know, last year, they a lot of people thought that maybe Oregon 
was going to make the playoffs. I was one of them preseason. That was my dark horse to make the playoffs. There could be an argument that they were better than Oklahoma. Oklahoma made the playoffs. Of course, that's we'll never know that because they never played each other. But Oregon was good enough last year. They had one slip up. I won't count the Auburn game as a slip up because it was week one and they had Auburn on the ropes down to the very last play of the game. They very easily could have won that game, but that's not what kept them out of the playoffs. Losing to Arizona State was a slip up. So this is something that that really, really good teams tend to do. In order to be great, you can't lose those games to Arizona State. And Cle listen, as a Clemson fan, I know all about this. Uh, we went through a long time where we were winning all the big games and losing to you know, Wake Forest the next week or Duke or whatever. So uh, that that's the difference. That's the hump you got to get over. I think that Oregon is going to be the next great team um, to come along. Love the conversation with Pigskin Pete. Please join him on his YouTube channel. Follow him on Twitter as well. Again, it's Pigskin Pete. If uh, you have yet to check out his content, what have you been working on uh, recently? Doing a lot of just, uh, you mean as far as YouTube goes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll, uh, we'll, stay, we'll stay with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, just doing uh, my, my my weekly regular videos where I'm you know, giving news updates and my opinion on uh, some of these newcomers that are coming in. A lot of things that we talked about today is, is what I'm working on. And uh, and also trying to do more live shows. I like to talk with the, uh, with the fans and uh, getting into some things other than just football during the off season here, talking about music. I know you stopped in the stream the other night. I, uh, I, I think I did one on Saturday about TV shows, trying to keep it loose and fun in the off season, trying to fill some time until, uh, until the football comes back. I got to tell you, man, to keep my attention in a live stream for more than five minutes, man, you must've been doing something good. That was a, that was a fun conversation. And I got hooked because man, I run across these lives. So, like I'll jump on YouTube and I'll see, oh, so and so is live, so and so is live, and and I gotta say, man, I hand it to the people that watch me on a regular basis that actually watch the videos and say, oh, Mark, I check all the live streams out, I watch all the videos, and I'm like, God bless you, because <laughs> I don't have that kind of attention span or that kind of time commitment that I check out a live stream. I'm like 15 seconds, and I'm like, you know, I may say, hey, good job, keep it up. Right. Good to see you, and I'm out, but I stuck around for 15 or 20 minutes. Well, I appreciate it. Every, you know, that's one thing that it doesn't matter if, you know, since I do a, a college football YouTube channel like you do, you're always going to get uh, people get their feelings hurt because you say something about their team, or and there's always going to be a lot of butting of heads over the football because people let their fandom get in the way. I completely get that, and I actually embrace that, you know, happening with the, within my chat. But with the music thing, this is the only time that an Ohio State fan, an LSU fan, and a Clemson fan can all agree on who's uh, you know, the best guitarist of all time or, or whatever. So it's, it's a lot of fun to do stuff like that once in a while to remind each other that there's more to life than football. There is music, too. <laughs> Who is the best lead guitarist of all time? Uh, I would probably say Eric Clapton or Jimi Hendrix. I'd, uh, Clapton is probably the one I would go with. Okay. I yeah. can't uh, debate that in any such way, but those seem like uh, pretty standard answers there. That that makes sense. Mm. All right, Pigskin, we appreciate you dropping by and uh, sharing some knowledge with us. It's always a great time, Mark, uh, and I will see you guys next time.